got my water bottle last week. Now I'll be hydrated. Won't nice. Care. I love when that happens. I start with <laughs> coffee and then I and then I need to quickly get some water. All right, we're good to go. All right. It being close to time. Um, and who, who our first applicant of the morning is Matt Dearson. Is that uh, right? That's correct. Do we have Mr. Dearson on the phone? Uh, yes, we do. He should be able to speak in a minute. Okay. Matt, we have uh, Matt Dearson. Are you there? Can you hear me? Can yeah, you hear we me can. Now? Thank you. Yeah, right as you asked if I was there, I got disconnected. Somehow. Okay. So, um, Mr. Dearson, is there anybody else from the applicant team who is participating with you this morning? I haven't been able to see the participants until now, but let me look. It appears as if the clients are not dialed in, but okay. I don't think that that's a huge deal. Were, were you expecting them to be here this morning? I was. Um, well, now wait, there's attendees. Oh yeah, Sarah, Sarah Kesson is here. Uh, okay. That is one of the two clients, sorry. Subin, um, can we let Sarah Kesson in? Will do. Thank you. Hi, good morning. All right. All right, we're gonna start then. Um, good morning, everybody. This is the time and place set for the Zoning Board of Adjustments City of for the city of Pittsburgh hearings on September 10th, 2020. Uh, and the first case of the morning is zone case 157 of 2020 for 3357 Ridgeway Street. And we have Mr. Dearson and Mr. Ms. Kesson, is that right? And I'm gonna ask you- Yes, thank you. Both first, um, do each of you swear or affirm that the information that you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And Daniel, could you read in the case for the morning? This is zone case 157 of 2020 for 3357 Ridgeway Street. The applications for the change of use of an existing two-story building to a first floor art gallery with a second store residential unit and replacement of existing non-conforming signs. They're requesting a variance from 914.02. Two additional parking spaces are required and none are proposed. And a special exception from 911.02 and 921.02.a.4. Art or music studio is not a permitted use in the Hillside Zoning District. Certificate of occupancy uh, that is unfiled issued in 1993 for continued use of existing two-story structure as beer distributor. A special exception is required for a change of use from one non-conforming use to another non-conforming use. And a variance from 921.03.f.2, existing non-conforming signs are proposed to be re replaced. All right. Um, Mr. Dearson, are, are you leading the um, evidence here? Sure, I am. I don't know if video is helpful if you um, need to see me. Well, <laughs> but, um, how else are we to judge your credibility? There you go, right. Or the blue color that my guest room is still painted that we there never fixed. Um, so this is the site. The site is technically in Polish Hill because Ridgeway Street is the border of Polish Hill. It's also the council district border, but it's right above Bigelow Boulevard. Um, this building, um, and we'll see that in the site photos, which are also uh, uh, one of the exhibits. But the building is a 1920 era brick structure. It is two stories relative to the street and four stories relative to its rear because of the extreme fall off of the slope. It's sitting in a field um, that is completely open and unbuilt. The lot um, to the looking at this plan plan right of that is a lot with a uh with a billboard easement that is also that was part of the purchase uh by my clients when they bought the building last year the lot to the other side is the city lot that we would love to purchase but there really isn't any means of doing that currently um the business that has been there since i think time immemorial is the king of the hill beer distributor which was kind of a convenience store and beer distributor uh, that served the neighborhood and the, the city as a whole. Um, 
the site essentially being zo zoned hillside due to the slope is uh, it is not uh, it's not technically feasible to put parking on it. It's also, as we'll see in the photos, not really a parking crunch uh, because basically to the uh, the the right hand of this plan is north. So to the north of it, headed towards the Bloomfield Bridge, there are not houses or just a few houses along Ridgeway Street. And to the to the south of it, there are much more dense houses as you get over towards, uh, I guess it's Heron, um, or not Heron, oh, as you get closer towards the city. Um, parking along the hillside adjacent to the building has never been an issue. In fact, the, the beer distributor, I think, kept two or three large trucks there on a regular basis. Um, this the, the gallery use and the single uh, unit residential is a, a lower impact. Um, they intend to use the, the gallery space both as an active art studio for, I think, basically one or two individuals, as well as a, a occasional um, shows and, uh, and openings. Um, if we go to the photos, I can just walk you through those. Uh, those are the elevations. You can see how, how things fall off. Um, oh, wait, can you go back to the photograph? <laughs> it's like that, that helps to orient. Yes. So that that gray, light gray roof is the building. There's no buildings um, adjacent to it until you reach the uh, the paper street of Hancock Street. You can see Hancock labeled and there is there may be steps. I think there actually are not steps there, but there's a paper street down to Bigelow that is Hancock. So everything to the south, um, which is left of the building you see here is that city owned lot. The, the lot itself is a through lot that is basically just the foot, the width of the building. And then the lot to the right of it, where you can see the billboard in plan, um, is also owned by uh, my client. And then there is city stairs on the other side in the right of way of that adjacent street. But that pickup truck that you see there and sort of back from that point is where historically people who've been going to the beer distributor park. And okay. I'm, I'm just, I mean, it looks like there's some on-street parking, but um, it, where the pickup truck is by the building, is that um, there's no sidewalk along that stretch? No, the pickup is parked on the sidewalk, I would say. If okay. we go to the street, if we scroll into the next photos, we'll have some better, this is the frontage. And you can see in the photo, in the aerial photo, you can see where the sidewalk has been replaced by the prior owner. So that's the lighter colored concrete in the aerial. But if you go to the next photo, I think we should be able to see the street okay. better. So this is the condition, the pickup that there's the white pickup truck actually. Right. Um, but I think in the aerial photo, he was actually up on that asphalt sidewalk. Um, right. But I don't know that that is necessary. Okay, yet. no, I was just curious yeah. about right. the, the street parking. Okay. Yeah. Carry on. Um, so and, oh, go I, ahead. Are, the nature of the use, you're describing it as a um, art studio with occasional events. So we're we're evaluating that against the existing non-conforming beer distributor. So um, you know it's always a challenge when when you're dealing with sort of the the day-to-day -day, um, use, which is pretty limited, um, as compared to um, what are you envisioning um, events to look like? How many do you anticipate having? And um, it seems like a fairly small footprint. So um, right. is there a limit on occupancy or the number of people who could attend that type of event? So uh, it is a small footprint. The, the base floor area of each floor of the building is around 900 square feet. It's, okay. um, and, and given that we need to add a restroom to the ground floor, we'll be down to, you know, six or 700 net usable. Um, there is only one means of egress from that space. So we will be limited by building code to 49 or less occupants. And that's okay. a realistic number, even for like a standing room event, there's not gonna be more than that many people. Okay. And I, I will defer to Sarah as well, if she has more, um, detail on describing the use or if I'm being accurate, she can just confirm that. 
Well, and the the other question I had, Sarah, I, I don't mean to to cut you off, but I have I have another question just generally. The, so I understand it. The the proposal is to have the uh, a single uh, residential unit on the upper floor. Um, has the upper floor been used for residential use, or was it used for the um, beer distributor use in any way? The upper floor was built as an owner occupant apartment and was used in that capacity, we understand historically, but since uh, since at least the time of the certificate of occupancy in 93, the owner has not occupied that apartment and it has been used as a portion of the beer okay. distributor. Most recently, there were offices up there. They had some promotional material they were storing up there. Okay. But so we're proceeding from a building code standpoint that it's a change of use back to the residential occupancy. Got it. Okay. Just thank you. But it has its own distinct stair and is obviously set up that way. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Back to Miss Question. Sorry. Did you did you have anything you wanted to add about the the nature of the proposed art studio use or events? I would say that Matt is capturing everything correctly. I just wanted to verify that that's our understanding also. Okay, thank you very much. All right. And then the other item uh, that, that's being, uh, uh, other than the, the obviously the non-conforming uses in the age zone and the parking, um, they would like to, as a part of the arts uh, focus nature of the, of the building and the programming, they would like to reuse the sign locations that are on the building, which are large and depicted in the subsequent photos and also in the elevations. So this is the side facing sort of uh, northeast. And if we scroll forward, we'll see more detail, I think, of those signs. This is at the low end. It's The building is 42 feet tall on one end and 23 on the other. So it's a pretty extreme uh, slope along the edge. Um, but this sign, our understanding is that below it is a painted beer sign. I think it's Coors Light or Icy Light or something the, the, that the most recent owner had this temporary sign made and he put up over it. Um, if we scroll forward, you can see on the other side, there's a similar high wall sign. And then I think there's a photo of kind of the ghost sign, which I, we would not be touching. There was an old advertising sign there um, from before. Um, and then obviously the signage along the front of the building. Um, we don't have a firm, you know, understanding of, we, we don't have a firm direction on what the signage will be. It, it's gonna be, I mean, the intention is to use it for like an artistic mural type of uh, uh, an application, not, uh, not an advertising sign per se. I mean, obviously there'll be a, a name for the building itself along the frontage. Um, I don't know that that may or may not, you know, the, the, the name of the gallery may be incorporated into the side signage as well. Uh, maybe Sarah can speak to that, but we're very preliminary. We're just trying to understand if that's acceptable. So one of, and, and I, I, I'll let the other board members raise questions as well, but um, before you can have a change of a non-conforming sign, you have to prove that you had a legal non-conforming sign previously. Um, is there any indication of that what you would be replacing um, had any kind of certificate of occupancy or was um, considered to be legal in so any as, other way? As near as I can tell, there is no CFO on file. There's a CFO associated with this plot for a billboard that used to face Bigelow that's been abandoned. My understanding, and perhaps Sarah can speak to it in more detail, was that the prior owner was either in the process or understood himself to have been complete in the process of gaining some acknowledgement of those uh, pre-existing signs and their legality. That being said, if there isn't a CFO, it doesn't seem like he completed that process. I, I was going to say that. It, right. I think that the, the lack of certainty about what was previously permitted or might have been acknowledged as a, a non-conforming use um, is really important to the understanding of what we can consider because um, under it's section 921.03.f, 
I mean, non-conforming signs aren't supposed to be changed at, at all. I mean, it, it's really, right. um, they're not to be replaced with advertising signs. I mean, there, there are a lot of regulation around that. And until um, you have a sense of more definition of what you want to do, mm -hmm. I, I think it's challenging for the board to say, sure, go ahead and do something. This is just a general question that I probably should know the answer to, but does the zoning code or city planning consider a mural uh, of the type, you know, that Sprout Fund does to be something other than a sign, or is that all handled under signage? Oh, that may be, again, those are questions that I think we'd prefer to be addressed um, with the planning department okay. before you request relief from us. Okay. Um, but there, there are provisions for art um, and there has been litigation about whether painting on a building that um, takes up the entire space and um, is clearly an advertisement for a, bi a business or another use, um, is that art or is it advertising? So, right. like I said, that, that you're raising some good questions, but I don't think you're, um, you have enough definition as to what you want to do for us to to consider that aspect of it so so i would say and i know that perhaps there isn't sufficient information to uh, you know decide this now i would say that my sense from looking at the building and you know the historic uh, uh the, the past of the building is that the signage along the front elevation if daniel would go back there or zubin whoever's got that got the <laughs> controls um that this signage and then the very large sign on the Northeast, which is over a painted advertising sign, may well predate code requirements for the for for uh, the CFO. These two King of the Hill signs, I feel less confident that there's something under there that was older. I, I guess that's just just to throw out there what I think is happening, but obviously you need that substantiated. Somehow. Yeah, I was going to say, right. I, I think it would be helpful for us to have an understanding of what had been previously approved, what might have been truly legally non-conforming, mm -hmm. and what's proposed before we can um, make a specific determination on that. Okay. So, um, I will say, and I didn't think about this because there's a sign behind it, but the large King of the Hill sign on the right was a vinyl sign, and we had some violent windstorms a few months ago and it came down. We had to tear it down. So now there's the painted, but there's still a sign behind it. Now it's, I think it's Miller Lite. There's a painted oh. beer sign behind it. So the one sign blew down to the point where it was dangerous. We had to pull it down the rest of the way. And now there's the painted sign behind it. So I don't know if that materially changes the argument or not, but. Again, I think it it it, it might be helpful in, in sort of sorting through what is the legal non-conforming aspect of it. Um, but again, for us to approve a replacement sign or to consider a replacement sign, um, it I think we need to have a better understanding of what's proposed. I mean, are you, are you proposing something in the dimensions of the sign that, um, you know, you had to be removed? Are you, um, proposing something that's consistent with a painted wall sign. It, like, we, I, I, I'm not seeing enough for us to, to go on um, for a specific decision on that. Yeah, I understand. I think the intention would be that the, the beer signs are very ugly and we're going to be an art space. So we would like to do something that's artistic, but I, I agree that we don't have enough of a plan. We were trying to see if it was even possible to get to the plan before we started getting my and, 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 and I appreciate that that the, the challenge of that but um, do did you have uh, were there other um, items in your materials that you wanted us to take a look at as we're going through here I think that uh, just the elevations were drawn to depict the locations of the signs and um, the only thing I would clarify is my understanding and I think Sarah can confirm is that the vinyl sign over the painted sign was the same dimensions as the painted sign so the the prior sign obviously we're not addressing that necessarily immediately but if Daniel if you went to or or Zubin if you go to the uh, the elevations we can there we go 
so those are depicting the the, the signage locations okay um but no beyond that there uh, there is not additional material okay all right um mr richardson ms burton falk any questions for the applicant no madam no Chair. questions uh, Zubin, do we have others who would like to participate in this hearing? No, we do not. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. It, it's an interesting space. And um, thank you for the good evidence presented um, with the reservations expressed with respect to the signs. But um, we will um, make a decision based on, on what you've provided and look forward to hearing from you again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here this morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, moving on to uh, zone case 161 of 2020 for 1689 Morningside Avenue. We have the um, applicant listed as Ryan England. We have Mr. England. We do. He should be able to speak. Good morning. Yeah. Mr. England, are you um, expecting anybody else with you this morning? Yeah, can we add the phone number ending in 6880? Okay. All right. And the person behind the 6880 phone number is? I'm sure Hello. on this phone line, we have Artem Dolinsky, uh, the building owner. Okay, and Mr. England, um, we're getting a little bit of garbling, so um, I'm wondering if you could okay. use a different mic or just be mindful. Yeah, I have um, slowly. How's this? All right. I'm first going to ask you both to um, do each of you. From whom are we getting the background noise? There we go. All right. Um, do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, I Mr. Do. England, you're, you're back on mute, I'm afraid. Oh, you can't hear me at all? Now we can. Thank you. Um, okay. And Sorry. Daniel, could you read in the case, please? This is zone case 161 of 2020 for 1689 Morningside Avenue. The application is for the continued use of a structure as a two family dwelling, requesting a variance for review from 911.02, uh, review of a continued use as a two family dwelling. Okay. So, Mr. England, are you starting? Yes. Um, great. Okay. So we have a presentation up. Yes. Um, 1689 Morningside Avenue is an existing two-family dwelling in, in Morningside. Um, it's in an R1DH district. Um, we kind of have pre and post rehab photos here. Um, Daniel, if you can go to the next slide. Um, this is just some context. It's, you know, it's in a totally residential neighborhood. The commercial district is about two blocks down. Um, the neighborhood is mostly um, single family, but the um, the house on the corner is, is also a two family dwelling at 1697. If we can go on. Just some context photos, the um, dwelling is at the left and you know, you can see the street life and then the, the next photo as well. Great. Um, and if we go to the next slide and I'm going to, um, I'm going to do some background with the uh, owner and if you can just, um, Bear with me for a minute. We'll go through a little bit of the context. It's a pretty unusual case. Um, so Mr. Dolinsky, are you, you with us? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Okay, so you purchased the building. When did you buy it? Uh, I purchased it in, uh, I say November, October, November, 2019. Great. And it was advertised as a two unit building? Correct. Okay, and you had a, a title policy and they did a title search. Um, did they tell you that um, it was not a two family dwelling? Unfortunately not. No. Um, and for background, I spoke to the title company. They ran a title report um, and the zoning department did accurately tell the title company that the building was not a legal two family use. Um, but the title company said they probably didn't read it. 
was the words that they told me. Okay, Daniel, can we do the next slide? Um, so what was the condition of the house when you purchased it? It was a very, very rough condition. So you, you hired a contractor and, and they got a building permit? Correct. And we have the building permit application on the screen um, and we can see that it's checked residential to family dwelling. Um, so when the contractor was at the, the building permit office, were they told, uh, no, this isn't a two family dwelling, it's a one family dwelling? No, they didn't. And did the building department make them, you know, revise this paper application or? No, no they, they just, yeah, they just issued a building permit. And you didn't understand it was a one family um, dwelling building permit. No, of course not. Well, can okay. we? And so can then, we just, um, can we go I mean, to the next I, slide? I, I, hang on a second. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I appreciate the paperwork yeah. aspects of it, but could somebody describe mm -hmm. for us? I mean, apart from the fact that um, it was in poor condition, um, can you give us any description of how the uh, two units are separated out? Uh, can you tell us the sure. size of the lot? I mean, and is there any indication yeah. on the interior of the building? Um, as to when it might have been converted to two units. Right. If, I just have one other kind of element of the background and then I will, I will dwell on that for just a minute, if that's okay. Daniel, can we do the next slide? And so this is the inspection log from the city. And so you had an inspection on um, January 17th with Patrick Brown. And did he tell you that it wasn't a two family dwelling? No, he did not. Okay, when was it that you found out that this building was not a legal two-family dwelling? Uh, when we when we applied for uh, for a deck, when we applied uh, another permit to, to to make a deck, when uh, uh, when a constructor applied for it, he got back that uh, it's a single family. When everything was already done, and we just adding the deck, remodeling the deck. Great. Okay. Um, thank you so much. So, um, Daniel, if you can go on, I'll. I'll review the building context, and if uh, Mr. Dolinsky, if the board has questions for you after I've gone through this stuff, just uh, stay on the line. Okay, so we've got in the building, we have two kitchens, and these kitchens were renovated um, in, you know, in the same location and layout as the existing kitchens. And, and just to be clear, um, the point at which uh, the client, uh, the owner discovered that the, um, the building was not a legal two-family dwelling, drywall was already up, kitchen cabinets were already in, you know, um, a lot of work had already been done. And if we can go to the next slide. Um, there's three gas meters, one for each unit plus one for um, the house has just one boiler for the hot water heat. Um, you can see clearly on one of the gas meters, it's dated 1988. Um, that is, I assume, a, a marking from the gas company. Can we do the next slide? These are the two water heaters um, before renovation. Um, next slide. And these are the two electric meters. On the left is how they are now, and on the right is um, what you can see from Google Street View. Um, I should say here that um, I've been a licensed contractor for 12 years, and I've specialized in historic preservation and restoration and have extensive experience in the materials and methods used in local historical historical residential construction and renovation. Um, in the photo from Google Street View, we see a couple things of interest. First is we see um, insel brick siding. So the red siding, it's kind of that asphalt shingly looking uh, siding. And, and that was um, prominent in the 1940s and 50s. And by the end of the 1960s, it had been phased out. Um, aluminum siding, uh, you know, Alcoa aluminum siding was, was the prominent material. Um, and then by the 1970s, vinyl became a prominent material. So we, we do have some kind of dating from the aluminum siding. Also from the electrical sockets, um, the meter sockets, the base, um, if you were of the meter. On the left, you see they're kind of square, boxy, rectangular. And on the right, um, they're round, they're round meter sockets. And, and there's not like, you know, it would be clear. I know the photo is kind of grainy, but it would be very clear if they, they were the rectangular, square electric meter sockets. So they're um, the round electric meter sockets, and those, again, um, we see those 1940s, 50s, and 60s, but by the, the 70s, those meter sockets are also not in production. 
and we see clearly there are two meters and then there's kind of the the um to say the water meter uh, remote reader um is the the kind of other little box that you see in the picture um and so you know these factors indicate the date of the um two family conversion to be you know somewhat uh, substantially older um than the 1988 um gas meter um and lastly uh we contacted the neighbors um uh, you, some of neighbors, go back uh, to my my original mm -hmm. question yeah. mr england which was um mm -hmm. I, I understand that you're um, dating the two unit use to the 1940s based on the electric meters and the the siding um, but I'm curious mm -hmm. about the size of this lot um, as compared to other um, lots in the immediate vicinity. And um, oh, sure. you, you had said that it is a primarily um, single family residential district. Is there any indication of uh, when a single family residential designation was put in place? Had it previously been a two-unit district? I mean, is there any information of that nature? Right. To the best of my knowledge, this was always a primarily single-family district. Um, you know, basically what, what we're describing is a two-family use that appears to predate the 1958 um, zoning code requirement. Um, the but lot is, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a site plan. The lot is not particularly large. Um, it's about the same size as all the other lots in the neighborhood. Um, the the dwelling is three stories with uh, one unit on the first floor and one unit on the upper two floors. So a one bedroom unit and a three bedroom unit. And how for, um, you said it had been in a deteriorating condition. Had it been vacant um, prior to the purchase in 2019? not vacant no okay. and is it currently occupied it is currently occupied yes okay okay so lastly we contact the nearby neighbors um unfortunately we can't find none of the nearby neighbors have kind of historical knowledge dating 50 years back most of the neighbors have been in the area for 10 or 20 years um, there's been a lot of change over um uh both neighbors uh told me they had no objection to the two family use and mostly they were glad that the um, building uh has been renovated because it was in quite poor condition and there was some trouble i guess with previous tenants um and we are aware of um, some concerns about the size of the deck and some screening concerns which we are working to resolve and um i believe that one of the neighbors indicated they might attend this hearing so i don't know if there's well, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, the, the other question mm -hmm. I had is um, for parking on site, is there any parking? Because there's not been a request for a variance from the parking requirement. Sure, there is. Um, there's a gravel parking area at the building rear off of the alleyway um, with space for two cars. Okay. All right. Um, any questions from Ms. Burton Falk or Mr. Richardson? No, no Madam Chair. Okay. And, no questions. Uh, Zubin, do we have anybody else who would like to participate in this hearing? No. Okay. Wait. Yes, we do. Uh, okay. Matthew Stewart. All right. Can we unmute Mr. Stewart? Hello. Hi, could you identify yourself for the record, please? Yeah, I'm Matthew Stewart, and with me is my partner, Ryan County, and we own the house at 1691 Morningside, um, which is about, we basically share a wall with this dwelling. Okay, and um, based on the presentation, um, do you have particular concerns that you would like to bring to the board's attention? Um, yes, this is Ryan County speaking. Um, I do not have an objection to the home being a two dwelling unit. Um, as was previously said, um, you know, as homeowners in the neighborhood, we are very glad to see that the home is um, being better maintained. However, when you look at the lot, um, the original lot that I believe is available on the webinar, the deck size is about one third the size that it currently is now. 
When we bought our home, we knew that there was a small deck on the back. However, now it is three times the size, looks directly over our uh, backyard that was formerly fairly private. Um, we were not informed that this was going to be happening. No one asked us. Um, and I did complain to 311. Um, I put in notices about the permitting of the deck. Um, and there's also a gravel driveway that was not previously there. Um, the backyard has essentially gone from a backyard uh, with the majority of it being grass that previously wasn't maintained. So this is definitely better, but um, now there's about 20% that's grass. Everything else is kind of a shoddy gravel parking pad with a very large deck. And that's fine. I understand that might be the case, but I would, you know, as a homeowner living next to this unit, just like to express that that was a very frustrating process to see. That was not there when we bought our home um, two years ago. Um, we, it was, it's not, it wasn't very neighborly. Um, again, yeah. that's basically well, our. It, and and I, 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 I'm going to just say one thing. The, the issue that's before the board today is the two unit use. Right. And I appreciate concerns with not being notified about other aspects of the property. And it may be that the uh, deck exceeds the size, the size that is permitted under the zoning code. Um, but the deck or any variances requested or necessary for the, for the deck aren't before the board today. I understand. So, um, I would like the um, applicant to address that issue briefly but um, the board can um, only look at really what, what is being presented and that's the proposed two unit use. Um, okay. So that, that I, I, like I said, I appreciate your concerns, but um, you are taking the right steps and calling 311 to question something that um, you know, may have exceeded a permit. So, but, but that's not what the board is looking at today. Right, so, I understand. We're the, we're we have the, no objection to the two unit dwelling. Okay, and, and I was gonna say, um, if uh, the property owner or Mr. England could address briefly um, the question about the decks, um, we would appreciate that. And we also appreciate sort of ongoing communications with your neighbors um, to maybe address some of those concerns, whether it um, be through landscaping or screening or some other form of cooperation agreement that is not necessarily before the board, but um, could could resolve the, the issues between neighbors. Sure, um, I'll be glad to address that. So yeah, I was made aware of the concerns about the deck size and especially the kind of looking over the adjacent yard on Tuesday. And I, I think those make sense. You know, I, I, I think we all understand that. And I don't think um, some screening is any problem at all. The deck was um, done by a different engineer. And so I'm trying to figure out what the status of the permitting is because the like stair and landing didn't fit. But um, I don't think screening is no trouble at all. Um, and so we'll figure out what the status of the permitting and the engineering is and, and get on top of of adding some screen. And, and if it's necessary, I mean, recognizing um, that uh, decks can sometimes appear without the pro proper permitting, um, apparently this is going to be reviewed. Um, and to the extent that there's, uh, again, it doesn't need to be before this board, it may be before this board. Um, but I would suggest that, you know, you all talk amongst yourselves to figure out what may be an appropriate resolution to that concern. Okay. Definitely. As soon as we get get the clear permitting picture, we'll be in touch with the agency. And, and um, it, since yeah. you indicated that you'd spoken on Tuesday, um, so I, I assume you know how to reach one another and we'll continue um, communication about that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, Mr. Coleman, are, it, are there anybody, is there anybody else on the line who would like to participate in this hearing? No, there's not. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Um, I think we understand the issues that the board can review, but there may be some additional issues um, to address. So work on those. 
And thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for participating. All right, thank we're going to so close this hearing. Was there a question? I'm sorry. Okay, hearing none, we're going to move on to the next. Thank you very much. Uh, the next case of the morning is zone case 164 of 2020 for, excuse me, 2431 Wedgemere Street. Um, the applicant is identified as um, Miranda Masiri. Is that right? Good morning. Here we have. All right. Um, do you expect anybody else to be participating with you this morning? Yes, my boyfriend, Zach. He's oh, he's right in the room with you. Okay. Yeah, All right. Um, I'm going to ask you both, um, do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, we yes. do. We'll, we'll get to you in a minute, but I'm going to ask Daniel to read in the case. This is zone case 164 of 2020 for 2431 Wedgemere Street. The application is to install a six foot privacy fence at the side and rear of a single family dwelling. They're requesting a variance from 925.06.a, maximum four foot fence height in front and exterior side permitted. Okay, and um, if you could identify yourself by name and, and spelling when you're speaking, we'd appreciate that. And we have your materials, so. Take it away. Okay, good morning. My name is Miranda Messier um, and this is Zach Hayes. And um, yeah, so we, um, I bought 2431 Wedgemere Street this past summer. Um, we closed in June and you can go to the next slide. There, I just added some photos of our house. Um, and you can see uh, on the photo on the right, that is like our side yard area um, to where the proposed fence would be. So you can keep going. And I added just some photos um, of how it looks now. Um, we haven't really done too much to the side yard yet since we just moved in um, this summer. And you can go ahead. Okay, I'm just, uh, can you go back to the, um, the so the, the side yard that you're proposing to enclose is currently enclosed with a chain link fence? It is, yes. Okay, so and that's so that the chain link extends all the way. Is that, um, is that Wedgemere or where? So this street- We don't have the site plan in front of us. So um, what are the streets involved? Of course, this the street along the left side photo is Galleon Avenue. So um, none of the fence would be along Wedgemere Street. It's primarily Galleon Avenue. And then the, the alleyway where the parking pad is, is Ava Way. Okay. And we have the site plans in our presentation. Um, okay. All right, we'll get there. I just, I, I was curious as to what I was looking at there. So thank you. Thank you, yes. So um, you can go to the next slide. What we're proposing is to put up uh, a privacy fence that would be wooden. Um, we hope that it would look better than what's there now. Um, we're gonna make sure that it's properly maintained and, and done correctly. Um, you can go to the next slide. Do you wanna? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so uh, hi, my, my name is Zach Hayes. Um, you, uh, what you see in front of you is the site plan. Okay. You can see uh, Wedgemere. On the, the northern side, and then Galleon Ave, and then Ava Way on the south. Um, our proposed fence basically is just mirrors the existing fence, but it is about a, a one foot offset towards the, the middle of the property. And that's the reasoning for that is just to have some space between the um, the existing sidewalk and um, and the fence, and also. Um, it, it seems that some uh, on Ava Way, whenever you're pulling out, turning left, if you if you move to the next slide, um, um, sorry, the uh, I think it's two more slides. And then we'll, yeah, so uh, I ran some just site distance calculations just real quick, just to just to see what it looks like uh, right now. So if you're looking left, you you have 
um, 180 feet of available sight distance. And I just ran um, just safe stopping sight distance, looking left. And the, that calculation is just based off of ASHTO standards. And I came out to find a, a, a safe distance to be 152. Now that, that's with existing conditions. Um, since we're offsetting the fence towards the um, towards the, the, the middle of the property, there'll be even more sight distance. And I was out there um, today and I, I looked out and I was able to see all the way towards Pioneer Ave, which is the, the main road um, looking left. And that, that's about eight, 800 feet of sight distance. So uh, in terms of sight distance, um, that there's, there, there'd be no issue there um, well, as far as I'm concerned. And, and I appreciate that calculations because oftentimes people are not sensitive to um, why it would be that you wouldn't want a fence plunk on right. the, um, uh, the property line um, because it does affect the entire street. But um, if you go back to one of the renderings you provided in the um, earlier photographs were of privacy fences that weren't stockade. There we go. Um, are you anticipating um, some form of transparency? Um, this the, the fence on the, the left that you show um, shows some some light and some um, space in between the, the, the um, fencing material with um, even greater um, sort of a lattice feature at the top. Is right. that the type of fencing that, that you're intending? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because it, and because a fence to a four foot height would be permitted, it's the extra two feet that create a challenge in terms of what the code allows. Right. So some, like I said, there's a difference between um, building a stockade and creating a fortress or allowing some elements of light and transparency. Right. So um, if if the upper portion is intended for that, um, I think that would be, that helps us evaluate what you're proposing to do. Okay. Okay. Uh, did you, uh, Mr. Richardson, Ms. Burton Falk, did you have any questions of the applicants? No, Madam Chair. Okay. No questions. And, um, did you have an opportunity? I mean, I, I understand you're new to the neighborhood, but have you had an opportunity to talk to your neighbors about what you're proposing to do? We have, yes, and they're all in favor for it. Okay. They were like, why didn't you just do it? So, <laughs> <laughs> because you're following the rules. Well right. done. All right. Is there, um, Zubin, is there anybody on the line who would like to participate in this hearing? No, there's not. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for the information you provided. It's really helpful for us to, to see it the, in the full context and, and um, understanding the site distances helps us as well. So thank you for the presentation. Um, the board will uh, make its decision um, in the time that it's allowed. So thank you. All right. Best of luck. All right. Take care. All right. Uh, moving on to the next case for the morning is uh, zone case 158 of 2020 for Clement Way and Mannion Way, uh, parcel 49P306, 306A and 307. Um, the applicant is identified as Yoko Tai. We do not see Yoko Tai right now. We do have Joseph Bernardo. I believe he is with the team. Okay, let's see who, what we've got here. Um, Mr. Bernardo, are you, are you here on behalf of um, Yoko Tai and Clement Way? Yes. Could you identify what your role is with respect to the project? I'm a partner uh, with the owner Greenfield Ventures LLC. Okay, and are you, are you presenting the case on your own? or is somebody else participating with you? Uh, Brian Stillwell's on the phone. He's the other owner of Greenfield Ventures. Um, we are 
expecting Yoko Tai to present, but we can present if uh, if uh, you'd like. Is Yoko with the Wakefield Law Group? I don't believe so, no. Is okay. there an architectural firm? Yeah, Yoko Tai is the architect. Yeah. I'm just because we're we're looking at the participants being identified, so we're trying to figure out who that might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, I I mean, I don't know who the law group would be. Well, we have it. We have a number of hearings today, so it might not be for your case. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi, this is Brian. Um, nice to meet you all. Uh, oh, Yoko was, was intending to present. Um, I'm not entirely sure where she is. She may have had a personal conflict or experienced technical difficulties. So we'll uh, we'll do our best to present on her okay. behalf. Okay. Well, we're we're gonna stop you for a second. We'll we'll um, I'm gonna ask you both to swear in. So do you swear from that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And we're gonna ask Daniel to read in the case, but. As you're going through, we'll we'll keep an eye out, um, Zubin. If you could keep an eye out for Yoko Tai, um, we'll. Looks like she just joined. Yeah, there we, we do go. Have Yoko now. There we go. All right. The right buttons apparently. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask you: Do you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Miss Tai. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. And then Daniel's going to read in the case. Thank you. This is zone case 158 of 2020 for three parcels at Clement Way and Manning Way. The applications for the construction of one new residence, they're requesting a variance from 903.03.d.2. Uh, 15 foot front setback is required and zero foot is requested for a six foot fence and a variance from 925.06.c. Four foot interior side setback is required and two foot is requested. Okay, all right. Um, is is it okay to uh, in, uh, the ask about the um, uh, the interior set, side set setback right now? Um, I think it may have been misstated that, that it's not the um, interior side yard that we're requesting a, a here, a, the um, the variance on because that's already over five feet. It's the, uh, the Clement, one of the street side yard. So Clement Clement Way is not a street, so it's considered Alley. to be an interior side. I see. So it's from okay. the um, Clement Way side that you're requesting a variance. We would still consider that an I interior see. side. I, I didn't even understand that. Okay. But but just so I understand, on as we're looking at the site plan. Um, the proposed structure would comply with a five foot setback on the um, left hand side, but on the Clement Way side, there would be a two foot setback. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's help. That helps us to understand as well. And uh, the, currently, the building, um, if you go to the next slide, you can see the uh, originally it was a three small lots. Um, barely 700 square feet. It is being combined to a one lot um, of over 2,000 square feet. And as you can see on the historic map, there was a three little lots there. And in this area, the, um, the lot of the buildings were built right to the alleyway. Um, the right, and um, it traditionally is very, very tight. Uh, properties. So we, we're increasing, but we're, you know, and we'd like to build at one building on it. Um, is, the, is the site currently vacant? Um, yes. But yes, if you go to the next slide, okay. um, the, um, it is, it's, it's empty right now. Mm -hmm. And um, you can see how it sits uh, right on the uh, property area. Got it. And then it, this, uh, the um, those sky view shows some of the uh, contextual setbacks. Um, the across the man, uh, the uh, Clement Way is a zero setback, and the other uh, the building on along the Manion Way is also has a zero setback frontage. Okay. And then the side on the uh, facing across the street on Clement Way is also zero setback. Yeah. So ours would be set back by two feet. And is there is there any historical information about the the structure on this site 
Um, you, you said it, it's the consolidation of three lots, but the uh, is there any evidence of the previous structure having extended to Clement Way? Um, the uh, the if you go back to the previous uh, slide, uh, this the three building three lots originally had structure on each of those lots. Uh, that's how it was. It, it's whited okay. out, but there used to be a yellow cast there that indicated there were frame structures there. Okay, that, that's that's what I was trying to understand from the, the historical map. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Carry on. Okay, next. Um, so then let go to the next slide. Uh, we reviewed this already about yeah. the setbacks and go to the next slide. It shows uh, the kind of the context, uh, the left uh, left the upper side is the manual way. Uh, those are the zero setback, uh, the town uh, the homes that's on the across the way. Uh, the, uh, the lower left is where the vacant site is, where our building will be set and it's continuous. Uh, you can see that on the uh, looking from the Clemente and the um, manual way. And also the uh, view from the manual side, looking at the empty site. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is the structure that we're proposing. Um, it's showing in a massing. And uh, you can see the massing of the neighborhood buildings. Um, and well, they're, 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 they're really, they're, apart from the um, setback on um, Banyan Way, um, the structure itself complies with the um, the height and um, stories requirements under the code. Right, yes. Okay. So the the final, the, the other item um, that we are, you're being asked to review is about a fence and that would be on um, Mannion? Yes, Mannion to the left of the building is by five feet uh, faces the uh, Mannion way next to the garage that continues on to the side yard separation and to the right of the buildings along Clemente Way and you can see the fence way in the back there which comes out to the property and then um, it wraps around. So the entire property is enclosed with the, uh, the, um, with the fencing. Well, um, I guess the, the question is what, what is considered the front? The front would be the Mannion Way the where Mannion, the garage okay. is. Yeah. Um, but the, so the, the, the issue is having a six foot fence in the front setback or where only four foot would be permitted um, from, and I don't know if you were listening to the previous case, yeah. but um, part of the question is um, whether there's a transparent element to that. And it, from the rendering, it appears that that um, would be the intent, but um, is, is is that the intent to have a pure um, privacy fence or is it a, um, it, would there be some transparent element involved? Um, we certainly, we have not finalized the design of the fence. And uh, I think that basically to uh, add a segment off the site, um, so it can take on very transparent um, parents, uh, now having, um, you know, very solid looking uh, the right now we show a kind of uh, spaced out plat, you know, the uh, planking uh, that goes sideways, but uh, we have not come to a final detail on that. So okay. it would be somewhat transparent. Okay. And do we have, um, you have some additional materials. Are there other renderings of uh, where the fence would be or a site plan that depicts it? Uh, the, um, I think the site plan is really shown on a plot plan. And oh, the, if you go to this one, uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, next and next. Keep going. The next one, yes. Uh, the, uh, it went too far. <laughs> one back, one back. Okay, <laughs> so basically the fence would be bordering from the left. Uh, the, uh, th this one is a uh, floor plan of the garage area, so it's not, it's not showing up, but show it goes from on the red, um, border all the way around the building and it cuts back into the building toward the rear to on the Clemente side. Okay. okay. So that's where the two foot, uh, it kicks in. Got it. Okay. 
Sorry, this one doesn't. No, no, that's fine. And what are, what are the, 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 uh, the other plot plan? Yeah, the plot plan shows the locations, the one that was shown the first. I, I just want to make sure we see all the exhibits that you're providing. We're on page six of nine. What What are the other pages? Uh, the other pages are showing the, basically a floor plan, and there is that. Uh, oh, there uh, we go. The height. Uh, that is showing and there is a roof deck actually there is a little hatch uh, the stair that goes to that level and then and exit in goes into the building is three stories but it has an access to the roof deck which is pretty much bordered by the uh, uh, the roofs around it so but the the height of the structure itself does not exceed 40 feet correct okay. yes to the mid 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 roof point yes Got it. Okay. Um, is there anything else from your team that we should understand from um, Mr. Bernardo or Mr. Stillwell? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think the only thing we'd uh, like to add is we have uh, we have talked to you know the neighbors and there's neighborhood support because. Essentially, right now, you know, it's just a, a raw plot of, of land that we've we've cleared, right, to abate weeds and such. But it's not very uh, it's not very pretty. <laughs> okay, um, Ms. Burton Falk, Mr. Richardson, any questions? No, Madam no Chair. No questions. Okay, um, Zubin, do we have anybody else who would like to participate in this hearing? Yes, we do. The Wakefield Law Group. Okay. Hi everyone. I don't. I don't see myself on the screen. It's Catherine Wakefield from Wakefield Law Group. Uh, my clients actually own the parcel that, if if we're look, considering Mannion to be the front of the proposed structure, their their parcel is to the left. Um, so Could you it, identify um, who? I mean, it, it, the, like you could you identify yourself for the record? And do you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I'm sorry. I don't know if you heard me. I did identify myself as Catherine Wakefield, Wakefield Law Group, representing property owners Darlene and Dennis Natali. That's what we wanted to understand. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank and you. I, I swear that my testimony will be true and nothing but the truth. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, basically, I just need clarification. I think that you have answered my clients' uh, questions and concerns, but if we could just um, just confirm that the five foot interior side setback that is required under the code is not, there's no application for a variance from that with respect to the set the setback between parcel 308, which is to the left of the structure, if Mannion, if we're standing on Mannion looking back. That That's my understanding as well, that the, the, the um, applicant intends to comply with the setback on that interior side and that the, the uh, variance requested is from the Clement Way side. Okay, that, that was my client's only concern. Thank you very much. Okay, thank thank you for participating, um, and that that was one of the easiest things we can confirm all day. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Mr. Coleman, is there anybody else who would like to participate in this hearing? This time, no. All right. Um, with that, we will close the record on this hearing, and we will um, issue a decision based on the evidence presented. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We're going to move on. Uh, the next case of the morning is uh, zone case 159 of 2020 for Liverpool Street, parcel 22P15. The applicant is identified as Robert Bombach. Do we have Mr. Bombach? I believe we do. We identified Bob. as Bob. Okay. Mr. Bombach, are you unmuted? Hello? There we are. Hello. Uh, Mr. Bombach, do you anticipate um, the property owner or anybody else attending on your side? Uh, yes, the uh, owners, uh, Camille Golub and Jeffrey Brigo will participate as well. Okay, do Mr. Coleman, do we have those? 
individuals identified? I see Camille. Who was the other name? Jeffrey Rigo. Rigo. I do not see Jeffrey. Okay. Maybe if we okay. unmute, unmute Camille, maybe they're together. We are together, indeed. There you go. All right. Um, I'm going to ask each of you, uh, do you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? We do swear that. Thank you. Yes, we do Thank swear. you. And uh, Daniel, could you read in the case, please? This is on case 159 of 2020 for Liverpool Street, parcel 22P15. The applications for a new two-story residence with front and rear porches, fence, and detached garage. They're requesting a variance from 903.03.d.2, minimum five foot interior side setback required and three foot requested for garage. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bombach, are you presenting on behalf of the applicants? Yes. Yes, All please. Right. Yeah, Let's so see yeah. what you're proposing um, here. So my name is Robert Bombach. Uh, my address is 900 Middle Street, Pittsburgh 15212, and I'm uh, working on behalf of of Camille and Jeffrey. And uh, I think if we could go to the, the first image, uh, which would be the site plan. And so we are requesting uh, a variance to construct a garage in the northwest corner of the lot. The lot is situated on Liverpool Street and it abuts uh, Haynes Way on the north side of the lot. The lot runs north south. So in the northwest corner there, we, you can see the, uh, the footprint of the garage. It's proposed to be 22 feet wide by 30 feet deep. And uh, the main reason uh, for the siting of that garage has to do with a utility pole that is located on the frontage of the northern side of that lot. So it, from the west side, it's about 26 and a half feet in from the west uh, corner and about 22 and a half feet in from the right side or from the east side. And <clears throat> so the owners chose to use the, the larger width there. And so you can see we have a sidewalk coming from their backyard. Um, the, the overall project is a, is a new house that is situated in the middle of the lot that, um, that uh, complies with the zoning setbacks. So, the, the, so really, the only the only variance being requested is from the one interior side at the rear. Um, mm -hmm. Do we have any photographs of the condition of the alley and um, or the sorry Haynes Way? Yes. And um, are there other uh, garages that extend to property lines um, all along Haynes Way? Yeah. So if you go two images after this one, yes. Uh, so if you pan down there. If you look on the uh, the image on the top, you'll see this. That image is Haynes Way, looking to the east. So at the very right side would be the approximate location of the northwest corner of the lot, and so the uh, the garage would be constructed from there to the utility pool. If you look at where those two uh, vehicles are beyond, that's the other portion of their lot, and then you can see adjacent to that there's a garage that abuts. The, well, I would approximate it. Uh, we have a three foot right of way, and then for our setback, we have we're three foot off of the right of way. So I would approximate that our garage to be in line with that, or three foot back into the into the lot. Okay. But the of, of note, we're we're asking permission to be along the western boundary of the property. Right. No, I I understand that, and and that's the utility pole that's creating the challenge. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we we would otherwise comply with it if we weren't dealing with a utility pole. Well, and um, I guess the other question is: um, Is there any evidence that a um, garage structure or any other kind of structure was located um, on the rear of the site, or this is sort of a brand new location being selected here? I'm I'm sorry, I don't have a record of the historic map there, so I can't speak to that. I was going to say it. It looks like it's been vacant for a substantial period of time. Mm -hmm. It certainly has. So. Okay. All right. Um, were there, uh, did, did the property owners um, have anything they wanted to add to um, Mr. Bombach's testimony? Uh, yeah, if we could. Um, we have um, taken the time to try and contact the neighbors on both sides of the property. Um, the one that we did get through to, fortunately, is the one on that west side of the property. 
um, which is actually Pittsburgh Parking Authority. They own a vacant parking lot on that side. Um, we do have a letter from them that I emailed Daniel um, several minutes ago, um, just saying that they approve the building of the property. It's not going well, to- Well, they, they get to support it. They don't get to approve it, so. Certainly, certainly that they support uh, the, the building of the garage, that they don't have any issues with anything that they're doing. Um, but really it is, you know, it, it's quite a big telephone pole. Uh, it's not something, you know, we want to back into considering how much stuff is on it. Um, so it would, it would truly make sense, I think, for us to scoot the garage over to prevent that from happening, even if we have I'm to- I'm sure work. your neighbors appreciate that as well. Certainly. All right. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Richardson, Ms. Burdenfalk, any, any questions for the applicant? And yeah, Madam Chair. Okay, no thank you. Uh, do we, Mr. Coleman, do we have anybody else who would like to participate in this hearing? No, we do not. Okay. All right. We're going to close the record on that basis and we'll um, make note of um, correspondence from the uh, Pittsburgh Parking Authority as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank, All right. you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for being here this morning. We appreciate it. All right. We're going to move on to the next hearing, uh, which is zone case 162 of 2020 for 2701 Oakley Way. The applicant is identified as Rich Rohde. Do we have Mr. Rohde? We do. He should be able to talk in just a second. Okay. All right. Mr. Rohde, there we go. Yes. There you are. There we go. Um, do we have, uh, are you presenting on your own or is there somebody else who's participating? Uh, I'm presenting for uh, the owner of Bridge to Bridge, um, Rorick Roberts. He should be on the call as well. Okay. I see him. Okay. He's joining us from Portland this morning, so it's nice and early for him. It depends on whether it's Portland, Oregon or Portland, Maine. Portland, um, Oregon. So West Coast. We're on fire out here. I was going to say, I, I would I have sympathy and concern for you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, but I'm going to ask each of you, do you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board this morning will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. And I'm just going to note a um, typo on the agenda. It's the south side slopes, not slops. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, but... <laughs> Daniel, could you read in the case, please? <laughs> Good. This is zone case 162 of 2020 for 2701 Oakley Way. Uh, the application is for the change of use to a three family dwelling, and they're requesting a special exception from 921.02.a.4, change from one non conforming use to another. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Rohde, you're. Could you yes. explain what it is that you're proposing to do here? Yeah, so basically uh, my clients, uh, Rourke and Bridge to Bridge, they purchased this home back in May of uh, 2019. Um, and it was fully occupied and rented as a three uh, unit building. Um, now that they have acquired it, they're looking to obviously renovate it and bring it up to um, codes and things of that nature to make it a fully functional uh, three uh, unit property. Um, it's currently zoned as a two family property um, already, which we had applied for well, a building so permit. Let me, let me just stop you for a second. As I understand it, the yes. zoning district is R1D. So um, are you saying that there's a valid certificate of occupancy for a two unit resident? Uh, so I had filed for the building permit and the, the new occupancy permit. Uh, there was not any anything on file currently. Um, so when we went through that, um, we had to go through the, you know, zoning approval and it was approved already for a two family uh, unit. Um, but with it being two, the, the building is a duplex. Um, so 2701 and 2703. Um, but we are currently in the process of trying to get through the paperwork to make it a three unit for them, which in the slideshow that I presented, 
Um, they are, my clients are new to Pittsburgh um, and investing. They've already uh, handled five separate buildings for investment properties for flips and rentals already. Um, this was a part of the package that they had. Um, when they purchased this property, obviously being in Portland, Oregon, um, they saw it photos only. Um, and with that, the one side was fully occupied with the other two from the realtor report that they got um, from their realtor here was also occupied with um, just a one bedroom, one bath. And the bottom unit was a one bedroom, one bath with the current side. Yeah, um, I, I, you, know, you, you know this property better than I do. So um, I think yes. again, I want to go back to, you said it was a duplex sure. with the street addresses yes. of 2701, 2703. And correct said that it was a, it was fully occupied as a three unit. So again, yes. So there is a rear, um, there, there was a, uh, or there currently is a third unit, which is, um, I guess it would be the basement, but it does have fully functional windows and everything of that nature that they were using as a one bedroom, uh, one bath uh, unit as well, which they considered that 2701 rear, if that makes sense. Well, it, I, we're, we're only looking at your title page here. So if we could maybe move okay, yes. the materials. So I, I, yep, I also included um, some drawings from uh, Rorick's architect in Portland. Um, if we can go to that, the uh, basically the site plans and the layouts of everything there. Um, I did send those to Daniel yesterday. Okay. Well, they were I, in PDF form. Do we have a site plan? Do we have any photographs of the Maybe. site? Uh, we don't have any photographs. Um, we don't have any photographs that were submitted only because uh, they're not in good condition in the house um, because Rorick had previously had a second or a, a previous contractor working on this that did some demo and things of that nature back in May and they did not file for a permit um, and they were issued a cease and desist, which they did. Um, however, the two sides, um, the 2703 and the rear side were fully demoed out um, prior to us stepping, uh, basically applying for permits, applying for all this and starting the work over there. Well, I, I mean, essentially, I, I mean, I'm, I, again, it, it's, it's hard to, to assess without, we can get a site plan and we can look at photos of the area, but, sure. um, the, what I'm struggling with is the request is, to change from non-conforming two units to non-conforming three units in an area that's supposed to be R1. So is this a, I mean, how, how big is the parcel? Um, it, do you have any history of, um, I mean, if, if the duplex had been permitted was there a time when this um, zoning district was R2 where the a duplex would have been permitted by right? Do you have any evidence as to when a third unit, which may or may not have been permitted, um, was installed? So, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to get a sense of what, what, what's going on with this property. Um, are there parking spaces available for all three units? Like what, how is this gonna impact the neighborhood? May I speak? Sure. Um, there wasn't, there was three units that were there. And the only thing I remember somebody saying at the very beginning was that we needed to have the back area concreted so that would provide an extra parking space. So we did that to, for the third unit. And then that raised other concerns for that unit. And then, it, then I didn't realize that that had never been um, permitted properly. So that's why that's, I guess, that's what we're trying to do here today is to make it from a two, you know, a duplex to a 
triplex basically um, because it was already uh, occupied, but we don't have any history on, on the, occup the occupancy because the owner of it, when we picked it up, um, was collecting the rents and she was the one renting the three, you know, the other two units. She lived in one and rented the other two. Well, and I mean, basically you're asking us to um, make legal what hadn't been done legally previously. And that's- Correct. And, and we want to make- so we, And we appreciate that you weren't the ones who may have created the illegality. On the other right. hand, um, what's what basis other than um, because it was there um, supports the request to have I mean, this is an R1 district and you're asking to have three units. So I'm, I'm trying to understand um, what support you're providing for that. Yeah, um, what support? Well, that's, I guess, what why we're here too is to find out what support we need. Um, we did provide the plans to uh, update a few the things that were necessary when we talked to the uh, permits and the inspectors and stuff about what was needed. And so that's what we wanted to proceed with, which were basically uh, smoke detectors and a double wall uh, sheetrock. Uh, well, the, but those are those are building code issues, and right. we're looking at the use itself. So, um, okay. do you, again, to me, the density of residential use of the site is important. I mean, is it a eighteen hundred square foot lot or is it a thirty two hundred square foot lot? Um, is there any history as to when the third unit might have been installed? And that's why I'm asking about the history. Is there a time when um, this zoning district was R2, so the duplex would have been permitted by right? I mean, that's that's what I'm trying to understand. So, okay, yeah, I don't nothing that I know of. Um, the, and I, and I, and I would say I don't know of anything either, on my mm -hmm. end, of that being an R2 and this just being basically what it was as they picked it up. So. Yeah, same here. So I, we can get you the lot size. I mean, that's not a problem, but. Well, this is your opportunity to present evidence. So, I mean, I we, we have the packet that you've provided. It, it's yep. not anywhere in there. Uh, the, the, the lot size is 2,400 uh, square feet, roughly. So, I mean, the, that's in, in the highest density um, neighborhoods in the city. Um, the lot size per unit is um, not, it, you're, you're proposing 600 or 800 square feet per unit. So that's that's a pretty dense residential, um, I, I mean, that's pretty dense in terms of residential use, but. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, do you, again, um, you, you're not providing us with any photos right now, but um, could you, describe generally the context of the neighborhood. Is this the only duplex? Is it the only multi-unit uh, building on uh, the street? To my knowledge, it is not the only multi-unit uh, uh, house on the on their street. I have spoke with the neighbors um, and I do know that there are several other, um, you know, homes being used in the same, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I guess uh, aspects, and maybe they're not legally entitled to do that. that that's so part of the problem. That's, I mean, yeah. It, so <laughs> I guess that's where, that's where you know, uh, just by I guess doing our homework by talking to the the several neighbors that are right around. Um, uh, you know, it is all residential around here because it is in the slopes. Um, but uh, to I guess answer your question, I don't have, you know, any. Uh, I would assume none of them are legal. Uh, triplexes or duplexes that are being rented as such, if that were to make sense. Sure. So <laughs> my, I guess that's, so I guess that's why, I guess that's why we're here to, you know, try to get it done legally for them only because for them to put the amount of money that they're going to need to, to bring the, um, you know, residences up to, you know, uh, basically appeal for the rest of the neighborhood to not be you know an eyesore and things of that nature um they would need it to rent as a three unit um to uh, i guess basically you know make the make it worthwhile investment for themselves 
But, uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it, like I said, it's a, um, It's a, it's a challenging thing for us to to um, you know approve something that had been illegally converted. Sure, illegally converted. A absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, what would what would you need from us? Well, this like I said, this this is, I, it's not for me to be a lawyer. Um, yeah, or, right. sure. Um, and this is your opportunity to present evidence. So. Um, Mr. Richardson, Ms. Burton Falk, did you have any other questions for this applicant? No, Madam Chair, I do not. No questions. Um, and, and in the interest of supplementing the record, um, I would appreciate a, I mean, we might have a site plan, um, but some photographs of the surrounding area, I mean, to give us some context of it. Sure. Um, if there are any hardships associated with the site that, um, you know, prevent it from being used in a in a legal manner. Um, that that's also helpful. Okay. okay. I can certainly um, do that. Ms. Wait, hang on, um, Mr. Yep. Coleman. Is there anybody um, on the line who would like to participate in this hearing? Yes, we have two hands raised. Thank the you. The first being Sarah Hansel. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, could you identify yourself for the record, please? Yeah, sorry, I didn't change the, the Zoom. I'm my, my sister-in-law logged in. It's Brad Palmasino um, on behalf of the Southside Slopes Neighborhood Association. How are you? Thank you. Uh, and I'm I'm authorized on behalf of our board to speak in, in these zoning cases. Okay. So what do you have to say, Mr. Palmasino? <laughs> so uh, in, in general, the neighborhood association has serious concerns about um, the density of the neighborhood and the parking. And so, um, you know, there, there are very serious concerns about, about converting units to three units. You know, I understand and respect that there, I think there's a CFO for two units existing on this property, but uh, the conversion to a third unit of such a small dense building is, is, is in our view, not, a, not in keeping with the context of the neighborhood nor appropriate for a single family residential district. Um, had you had an opportunity to meet or discuss the proposal with the developer? I, I did. I have not. Okay. All right. Um, is, is that the, have you submitted a letter um, in that respect on behalf of Southside Slopes? I, I can. I, did, I figured it was either or, either the testimony no, or that's, letter. No, that's fine. I, I just wanted to make sure the, the record was complete. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and um, Zubin, did you say that there was somebody else who had their hand raised with respect to this hearing? Yeah, they're labeled as Galaxy S9. Hello. That, could you identify yourself for the record, please? Yes, my name is Gerard A. Cardello. Okay, and could you? Go ahead. And. Could you explain what your concern is with respect to the application? Yes. First of all, I I live up in the neighborhood. I was born and raised up there. As far as I know, that there is no duplex in the area. I know there's a lot of houses that are rented out to two or three people, but there's no duplexes that I know of. Okay. And my other concern is the parking issue. And now I know the house very well because I live there. And there's no parking in front of the house. The streets are tight up there. Although they did pour concrete concrete in the back of the house, which is feasible for only two cars, because when you come out of the driveway, you come out on a right-of-way street, Oakley Way, and that's a very well-trafficked area, huge street. Okay? And there is no parking whatsoever up there on the street because of the people that live on that street that rent the houses out. There's like three or four people living in the house and they take up all the parking on the street. And there's, definitely, there's no parking up in front of the house because there's a fire hydrant right in front. But that's my concern about the parking. And and far as I know, I um, the lady that owned it before, she only lived there for maybe a year. She bought it off the guy that had the place for about maybe 20 years, if not 25. And he always had two people living in it and i'm not really sure that he ever had a permit 
for being zoned for two apartment house. Because right now it is zoned, I got the letter in the mail for the city of Pittsburgh. It is zoned as a R1D H, which means it, it, residential single family dwelling, high density area because of the parking. Okay. And also last week in a reporter, September 1st reporter, they had an issue with um, uh, R, R1D zoning district, variance review 911-02. Use of a two-family dwelling is not permitted in R1D zoning district. And that was from the city. And that was in a reporter, Sasa reporter. Yeah. All right. And what, uh, Mr. Department. Carter, could you just tell us where your house is with respect to the... Um, the My, well, I, I have two properties up there. My house is directly right behind right behind the house that my house is at 2700 Mission Street. It's directly right behind the house that the zoning is being right now. Okay. And then my residence is down the street. Okay. Okay. So, and also my other, other concern, I don't know if it has anything to do with the zoning, but when they poured that concrete pad in the back, okay, they did not put a curb towards my side of the fence. So when it rains and all the down spots that they have, this empty into the driveway, so it all rolls down over to my side of the property and they should have put a curb up to block the water. So that right now it's rolling over the, it's rolling over the concrete and it's coming down into my property. And that, that you, the issue before uh, the board, it re relates to the number of units. So we're gonna, um, okay. there might be a construction issue that you need to address with the property owners as well. Okay. But um, I'm, I'm gonna let the applicant, is uh, Mr. Coleman, is there anybody else who would like to participate in this hearing? No, there's not. Okay, and I, I'm sorry, Mr. Cardell, I cut you off. Did you, was there something else you wanted to add? No, I just wanted to see if they say that is it was zoned for two units. Can they show the office is permit? Because I I think all this time I'm not really sure, but I don't know if that house was illegal or not with the two dwellings. It, it as I understand it, there is an occupancy permit for two units, but is they're okay? requesting to go to three. So okay, but um, could the applicant respond briefly to the concerns that were raised? Yes. Did you want to? Yeah. Talk either. About yeah. Either. Yeah. So I can. Could you, could you talk identify about yourself the, so that we have it straight for the court reporter? Who's speaking? Go ahead, Rourke. Oh. Um, okay. So this is Rourke Roberts, the owner. Thanks. Um, when we did do the concrete, there is a a V. Um, I've been to the I've been to the property myself because I come to Pittsburgh. Well, I have been coming to Pittsburgh. Uh, every couple of months until the COVID crisis. And then I've kind of had to put things on hold. Um, when they did, they built a V, like a drainage uh, from that to prevent the water. Um, and I've never, I have to be honest, I've never seen it rain until I've come to Pittsburgh. <laughs> well, and then I, I've have, seen I have to say that the, um, the, the question about the curb cut of the concrete pad is not one that's before the board, but um, we would certainly encourage um, you all to communicate um, with yes. respect to that issue. But um, with respect to the density issue, was there anything else that you wanted to add for the board's consideration? Uh, no, only the fact that it, it was occupied as three units uh, previously to us purchasing it. Okay. Um, did we have anybody Thank else who wanted to participate in this hearing? No, we do not. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Palmasino, um, with the Southside Slopes organization, um, could you get contact information for the applicants um, maybe to, to carry on conversations uh, because we do appreciate the input of the um, neighborhood community groups? Um, uh, yeah, so I'll be happy. I'll be happy to if you if someone wants to email me or um, what's the best way to do that? Well, um, I was going to say, I'm going to let you guys deal with that offline because we're yep. going to move on to the next hearing. <laughs> yep. Thank you. I would, I would appreciate the, um, to have some con uh, communication between the developer and the community group. Absolutely. We'll right. make sure we handle that. Okay. 
All right, and um, from the from the applicant standpoint, uh, if you could provide us with some uh, contextual photographs that um, yes. might be helpful for us to understand, we'd appreciate those to be submitted as well. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the next hearing, which is for Zone Case One Sixty Three of Twenty Twenty Thirty Four Fifty Nine Denny Street. The applicant is identified as Kevin Kordak. We have Kevin. He should be able to speak in a second. Okay. All right, Kevin Kordak. Yes. Do we, do you, are you Morning, yes. Are you anticipating um, other members of your team to be on this call? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Johnny Miller should be our presenter. He should be available as well. Okay, we have Johnny Miller. All right. All right. Um, do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, Daniel, could you read in the case, please? This is zone case 163 of 2020 for 3459 Denny Street. The applications for the subdivision of an existing lot into two 1,400 square foot and 1,042 square foot lots. Uh, they're requesting a variance from 925.01.c for the subdivision to smaller lots than zoning code requirements. Okay. Um so, Mr. Miller, I understand you're going to start. Can you explain what it is you're proposing to do? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your time. Um, so, the the owner of the property that Kevin and I each work for um, would like to subdivide this lot. He does own the adjacent parcel. Uh, if you're on Ligonier Street, it would be the parcel to the right. Um, so, he acquired that parcel uh, and then he subdivided those two parcels. So, uh, um, can you can you just start with a general? We we have the first page we have is has a sure. lot of green circles on it, and it's hard mm -hmm. to tell Absolutely. what property you're talking about. Um, yes, ma'am. So, the property in question is uh, thirty four fifty nine, and uh, if you bear with me, I can. I'm pulling up the plot plan. It's 49-N-210. Um, so it's about halfway, three quarters of the way up Ligonier. There, there that's we go. correct. Okay. Yes, um, and so uh, I'll give you the quick version. Sorry, I guess I was getting into too much detail, but um, ultimately he would like to subdivide this and upon subdivision, he would like to construct uh, a single family home on the new subdivided parcel. So, but is there any reason why um, the existing parcel that complies with the zoning code requirements for a lot size, um, why can't a house be constructed on the single lot? So there's an existing home on the Denny Street side of the property. Okay, so it's, it's being used. Um, so I, I guess what's the basis for the proposed subdivision into two lots that wouldn't comply with the minimum lot size? So our, you know, our presentation, let me pull it up here on my end. Um, we're obviously requesting a variance from the minimum lot dimension, which is 1800 square feet. Um, in the code 92209, um, I laid that out, but ultimately, um, in 925, it does specify that um, there's a minimum lot size per unit of 750. And if you look contextually at the vast majority of Ligonier Street, including the adjacent parcel, which uh, the owner that we're working for currently owns, um, the contextual, you know, neighbor characteristic of the neighborhood is that a vast majority of these are already two parcels uh, subdivided, one servicing Ligonier Street, one servicing Denny Street. When our client purchased the, the property in question 49-N-210, uh, um, again, obviously 
these things happen kind of like the last case, but he was under the assumption based on the entire uh, remainder of the street and the fact that he had already successfully subdivided uh, parcels 49-N-364 and then uh, the one directly behind it, which is dash 209. Um, so based on his historical success with subdividing those two uh, parcel or that one parcel into two parcels, he purchased 49-N-210 uh, with the intention of. But, but there's, there's no, I mean, what, what evidence, what hardship, what, I mean, again, I just, just mm -hmm. because he had gotten some approval previously for a different property doesn't mm -hmm. mean that there's evidence that supports the proposed subdivision here. So I, again, do we have any, you said that the half of the lot is already being used for a single family residence. That's um, correct. So uh, like, I, again, if, if it's complying with the zoning code, what's the basis for, um, splitting into two lots suppose just because you want to i mean like what what's the hardship that prevents it from from continuing to be used for for one unit yeah I, so i can continue to read down through our presentation which i believe addresses that um so uh again we meet the minimum lot size per unit of 750 square feet um, Wait, where, I, I, I don't understand um, where the 750 square feet is coming from. But I said that's in the code, uh, the same code that, that was referenced, uh, which is 925. Is that the, the lot size per unit for an R1AH? Yes, ma'am. But, but that's a lot size per unit um, as opposed to the minimum lot size. And what Correct. You're... They're both clarified in the, in the code. But, section but um, I guess here, here's another question. Mm -hmm. um, is there any evidence that the um, parcel 49N210 was ever used for two units? Our, our, we don't have historical uh, absolute confirmation on that. Um, there is an existing retaining wall that our you know, engineers believe supported an existing home at one point, especially given the fact that the, the remainder of the entire street uh, minus a very small number of those parcels uh, are front and back homes. Um, but you, you didn't pull up the historical maps and you're not providing that to us as evidence? Correct, not at this time. Could you direct me to uh, the, the location of uh, these historical maps? We're not your lawyers. Um, all right, Is, was there other information that you wanted to-, to Yeah, I have a whole proposal that I, I would love to, to review. Okay. Um, so I'll get back, I'm on the second line item here. I'll go to the third now. Proposed use meets contextual setbacks requirements. Proposed use is consistent with the vast majority of parcels on Denny slash Ligonier. Um, proposed use meets section 922.09E general conditions for approval. Um, so there are five conditions for approval as listed in section 9.20, 922.09.E. Uh, the first is that there are unique physical circumstances or conditions, uh, including irregularity, narrowness, or shallowness of lot size or shape. That is the hardship that we're proposing. The proposed subdivision is contextual with the remainder of the street. Condition is caused by the shallowness of the parcel. Uh, item two in that uh, 922.09.E is uh, because such physical circumstances or conditions, there's no possibility the property can be developed in strict conformity. Uh, I could continue, but that's well. I was going to say, but it but it already is being used in in conformity with the code. I mean, it's a single family use in a single family district, and the um, lot size per unit for an H district comes into play when you mm -hmm. have uh, a multi unit. Um, so, but you're not in a multi unit district. So right, it, we're not proposing a multi unit use. Um, I, I, and that's but, but what I'm saying to you that the 750 number that you brought to our attention um, mm -hmm. are for context where it's an 
RM or an R2 district, you have to have at least enough for 750 square feet per unit when you have more than one unit. What you're proposing to do is have a variance from the full lot size requirement, which is 1800 in the, in the R, R <laughs> for the- Yes, ma'am. Yeah, expenses. the only variance, that's correct. We're only requesting one variance, which is the minimal lot size. Everything else is compliant uh, but, in the zoning but, but code. But the variance you're requesting is fairly significant for to create two lots that don't comply with the 1800 when you're starting with a lot that does. I, I, yeah. I, yeah, okay. Well, again, so we agree that we're requesting a variance. No, no, um, I, I know that you are. Right, yeah, <laughs> so just, we're on the same page. But I'm trying to understand is the mm -hmm. support that you're submitting for. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Sounds like. Well, and again, so item one, the the physical condition is the shallowness of the lot. Item number two, um, the, the code specifically says that the property can be developed, not that the property can be maintained or utilized in the current existing condition. So we are seeking to develop um, and we comply with that. Item number three is such unnecessary hardship has not be, been created by the appellant. Uh, we haven't created a, this hardship, it's existing. Um, and then four, and I believe five are the, the, the two that we really think is the, the crux of our overall, um, our position is the variance if authorized will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or the district in which the property is located, not substantially or permanently impair the appropriate use or development of adjacent property, which again uh, is already subdivided and owned by our uh, property owner, nor be detrimental to the public welfare. Um, our response to item four is this approval actually will bring this parcel into the essential character of the neighborhood. So currently, as it's very clear to see on Ligonier and Denny Street, uh, we're one of a, a very small handful that is not currently in the essential character. Um, and then the fifth is uh, the variance if authorized will represent the minimal variance that will afford relief. And at this time that this is the minimal variance that would afford us relief uh, to utilize the parcel in the context of the essential character of the neighborhood. Um, the single unit dwelling exemptions under section 925.01.C um, do call out that a single unit dwelling on a recorded lot, which obviously is, you know, the first step which we're seeking to obtain, uh, would be granted under an administrator's exception. Um, and then overall, back to the, you know, that will this variance essentially serve the public welfare? Um, obviously, number one, uh, it's undeveloped property right now. Uh, this property develops vacant land. Uh, the property adds tax revenues to the city. The property uses the benefits of the neighborhood and in no way harms or diminishes the neighborhood. The property, the proposed use is consistent with the adjacent approved subdivisions by the owner. And again, back to 922.09.E, number four, that this approval will actually bring this parcel, which is currently not in the essential character of the neighborhood. Clearly the zoning was changed at some point um, into alignment with the remainder of Ligonier and Denny Streets. I think we understand your position. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, are, apart from the, the um, the submittal materials that you have, is there anything else that you want to present for the board's consideration? Um, Kevin, would you like to? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Yeah, um, I'm actually on a split screen here, my other computer. Um, looking at the historical maps of 1872, there was an existing structure. At that time, it was known to be Liberty Street, but there is a structure at one time, as Johnny mentioned, that um, you know our engineers had discovered that there was a a partial foundation that um, was still on the site. So looking at that historical map, he is accurate when he stated that there was in fact a home or a building on that side of the street at one time. And we would, we would ask that if, if that's additional information that you would like us to consider, if you could submit what you're reviewing, because we don't have Absolutely. it on your on split screen. So yes. if if you would like to submit that, we'll, we'll accept it and we'll consider that. Okay, should I send um, that to um, Svetlana? 
Should I email that to her? That's fine. Okay, great. Uh, Zubin, is there anybody else who would like to participate in this hearing? No, there's not. Okay. Um, Ms. Burton Falk, Mr. Richardson, any questions? No, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. We're, uh, with, the, with the additional evidence um, that was described, we will um, consider the application and make a decision. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Uh, I believe this is our last case of the morning. Uh, zone case 165 of 2020 for 6315 Forbes Avenue. The applicant is identified as Eric Phillips. We have Eric. All right. Mr. Phillips, is there anybody with you this morning? We need to get you off mute. Sorry about that. that there we go. Um, is there anybody else who's participating with you this morning? Yes, um, Sam Sam Kamen is um, going to be taking us through um, the points if he's online. He is. All right. Um, so do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and the, nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. I do, uh, Madam Sherman. Thank you. Um, Daniel, could you read in the case, please? This is zone case 165 of 2020 for 6315 Forbes Avenue. The application is to install a generator at the rear of a multi-unit dwelling. They're requesting a special exception from 916.06, waiver of residential compatibility standards for noise level, 45 decibels required and 60 decibels is requested, and a variance from 903.03.e.2, minimum 25 foot exterior setback required and four foot requested. Okay. So Mr. Kamen, do you wanna take us through the materials that have been presented? Yes, I will, uh, Madam Chairman, and uh, Ryan Wotus will also be present. Uh, I, I will go through the factual part. And, well, uh, I think I think we it, 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 we will consider the the statement and submissions, um, but it would be helpful for us just to understand. Um, I don't care to go through all forty eight pages of your submission. If you can just tell us quickly where the property is located, where the proposed generator would go. And um, I, what we understand with generators um, that um, typically the, the generators are only intended to operate um, in the event of an emergency situation um, or um, for a brief testing period once a week. So in that context, um, consideration of who would most be affected in those circumstances. And when you're requesting a setback from the rear requirement, I'm assuming um, it's the neighbors to the rear of the property who would most be affected on the limited times that a generator might be running. Um, so if we could just sort of cut to the chase on those issues, I think we'd appreciate it, but we will take into consideration the other materials um, okay. submitted. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh... I am an officer and an owner of Forbes Denison Land Company, which is Maxim Towers. It's located at Forbes and Shady in the Squirrel Hill area of the city of Pittsburgh. It contains 144 units high rise. They're 12 story building. Uh, the uh, building itself. Do we have in the materials, do, do are there, is there a page that we can turn to that would, would give us a context in a sort of yes. efficient fashion. Page two uh, of my. Uh... No, no, go down to page. There we two. go. OK, those are those are photographs. Uh, and also Strata in their submission also has aerial photographs as well as uh, a site plan that was in the Strata application. So if you are looking there, but I think the better photograph would be the next one if you're looking at it. Uh, there we go. That, so that's this is at one. the corner of Forbes and Shady, essentially. And the, uh, 
Well, there's the Ross property. The, right. Uh, I mean, it's 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 close. So we'll call it Denison and Forbes, close to the intersection of Shady. But um, do we have a site plan that shows where the proposed generator would be? It does, and uh, that uh, site plan is in Strata's uh, application. The application. It's the last page of the application uh, that was filed uh, with Strata. And that would be, uh, if you have it, it would be page 28 of 28 of the application filed by the, uh, for this uh, variance and for the uh, special exception. You're into my presentation. This is the separate uh, pleadings that were filed to institute it and a site plan was included. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have it available, but if you give me a moment, I think that I can find the site plan. And Daniel, it's page 28 of 28 of the uh, site uh, of the submission of the application. Just, just looking at it from the aerial while, while Daniel's pulling it up, at the rear of the, the um, building are a swimming pool and a tennis court. Um, well, yeah, actually, if I, if I may just take into context so you understand what's happened. Okay. Uh, what you are looking at right now is from the report of Thornton and Vibrations, uh, Acoustical and Vibrations. Okay. The generator is going to, is, is actually is located where the first red dot is, and that's number one. The closest residential is, the property line is 90 foot away along Denison, and the dwelling is 120 foot from the, where the generator is located. Across the street is the yeshiva, and uh, you see right. a third dot there, which is the uh, where they had located the uh, did, when we did our sound reports. That's where it was. But it was. now the back. Let me go. Uh, there okay. it is. There okay, we go. The back line. There you are. Now going back, uh, Ms. Madam Chairman. The area that you see in the rear of the thing where you have the swimming pool. That is the last piece of solid ground in the back. The rest of it is a garage, is the roof of the garage. And there is a 147 unit garage, two level garage underneath that particular concrete pad. Uh, so this is basically the only piece of solid ground that you can occupy the generator with. Uh, the, we have the report of strata saying that you cannot locate the generator anywhere else in the rear yard because the garage roof cannot withstand the weight of the new generator and or the vibrations which would affect uh, for the, the testing and from the, uh, if it had to operate. It's just not designed to do it. And it would create a problem with the underground garage roof. Uh, but am, uh, I, am I correct in understanding that the purpose of the generator is for emergency use only? And that is correct. For uh, a brief exercise period at some point during the week. Yes, if I if I may, Madam Chairman, let me just go back, put this in context for a moment. Uh, as I said on page two, we're a four, 144 units of 12 story building we have roughly about 20,000 feet of commercial space on the first floor. The building uh, was constructed in 1968, in 66, and we had at that time a fire system installed, which was in conformity with code. It is not a fire suppression system, it is a fire alarm system. The fire alarm system uh, basically works in such a way that the, if, there, if there's smoke, the fire uh, in the hall, or there's a pool station, the fire alarm system works. There's a fire hose or fire extinguishers, but there is no water, so there's no pressurized water system within the entire building. It is not sprinkler. As part of a $7 million renovation program, we have decided that to put in a fire suppression system, which is a watered system where you have water under pressure going up to all 12 floors. The existing generator does not support the pressurized water going into the 
new fire suppression system. We did that because basically we have a issue here with life safety uh, of our 144 units and 3000 occupants, roughly a third of them are elderly and at least 10 of them are under the age of 10. And, and I, I don't think we're disputing the need for a generator, Mr. Kamen. I, I really, I would, I would like to um, just try to just, if, again, if the purpose of the generator is to support the um, fire safety and the life safety of multiple residents in a 12 story building, we certainly appreciate that. What we're trying to focus on is the potential impact of the generator. And as I understand it, and with the substantial evidence that you're submitting, um, you're, you're indicating that it truly, it's a, uh, it's not like a generator that would be running 24 seven with multiple impacts on the use across the street or on neighboring residences. Um, then, and then, let, then let me get into, if I may, the easiest way. As part of my submission, you have the report of Thornton vibration and acoustics and vibration. We, we, we did see that. Um, and I, I think, that, again, that that is um, substantial evidence. Um, and we certainly will take the report um, into account. But but we did, I, we did the measurements. Yeah. And, and I, I, I again, we, we appreciate your thoroughness with respect to that. Um, but but it, the again, it, it, it really is for a, a limited purpose it's not intended as a, a full-time um, operating generator. That is correct. Okay, that, that's really what, what I wanted to confirm. And that, that it, that's significant when, uh, with respect to the waiver of the um, uh, noise requirement under the residential compatibility standards. Uh, but the, and then the, the I, I believe you also sus presented substantial evidence um, with respect to the the setback requirement as well, but just let me let me confirm because it's identified on our agenda as a, a rear setback. So is it the Denison side is considered the rear of the structure, or, but the building faces onto Forbes, or yes. is it the portion? If you look, if you look it, at the site plan, our address is sixty three fifteen Forbes Avenue. Okay. So this this is extending into the rear yard. It, it you com, you're complying on the Denison Street side, but you're a little close um, as you're going up Denison Street towards the rear of the parcel. That is correct. Got it. Okay. May, may, may I um, interject? I'm sorry. Um, Who is the, speaking? Sorry, this is uh, Eric Phillips, the, okay. the architect from Strata. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so. I, I believe it was um, it was wrong on the agenda. This this is a side setback, um, okay. facing facing a front, um, the front of a residential um, parcel across the way. So um, the setback there would actually be 15 feet, um, and we're we're asking for uh, five feet. Okay. So apologize oh, for that. On the on the Denison side. Correct. Denison okay. is the uh, the vertical street on the site plan you're looking at right now. Okay. And like I said, I just I want I want to ensure that we're that the appropriate relief is being considered. Sure. But that okay. So it's it's set back five feet from Denison, but across Denison is the school. Correct. And that, and there, so there are no residential units immediate. I mean, there's no residential uses immediately proximate. It's the school. There, there no, is a residential unit to the north of the site. Right, but but immediately across the street Correct. from the unit that um, where the setback is being requested, that's the school. That's um, the the other question I have: Have you had any? Because um, in other generator situations, um, we've had. Um, concerned neighbors uh, questioning when the exercise period would be run. Um, and depending on the neighboring uses, whether it's you know, residents where somebody is, is not home during the day, they'd prefer it be done at noon on a weekday. Um, when school's in session, noon on the weekday might be the worst time and you know, Sunday at two might be better. 
Um, has there been any effort to reach out to the neighboring uses with respect to the proposed generator or that type of um, preference with respect to the exercise period? Two, two points, Madam Chairman. Uh, we would be, we run it 15 minutes a week and it's run during daytime hours. The generator, uh, according to Thornton uh, Acoustics, has a, uh, it, the property line is 62 decibels. The ambient noise, if you look at the Thornton report there, there in, uh, during the daytime hours runs anywhere from 65 to 80. We are intending to run this once a week during the daytime hours, during the period of time whenever the ambient noise is higher than the uh, decibel ratings uh, from the generator. So we don't think it will add any significant noise to the uh, uh, background, basically because of uh, what the background noise is. And it, as I say, it runs between 65 and 80. Yeah, no, no, we, we appreciate that. It, like I said, in terms of when it kicks on, um, yeah. typically people have worse things to worry about if the generator is coming on in, the, in an emergency situation. But, you know, the courtesy about when the, the exercise period is being run is something- We would probably about. run it uh, approximately at two o'clock on a weekday. Whenever, if you take, if you look at the Thornton report, you'll see the big spikes that go there around uh, between 12 and two. Okay. Okay. So we'd run it when the spikes are there. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. That That is a comprehensive package of information that we will certainly consider in reaching our decision. Um, uh, any questions from um, Mr. Richardson or Ms. Burton Falk? No, Madam Chair. And Mr. Coleman, is there anybody else on the line who would like to participate in this hearing? Yes, we have a Joan Eisenberg. Okay. Uh, Ms. Eisenberg, you're on the line. Could you identify yourself for the record? Yes. Do, do, you swear, do you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, my name is Joan Eisenberg. I live directly behind this site on 1656 Deniston Street. Um, let me just say one thing to begin with, the generator is already there. It is already going through testing sites. They are already not following through with the particular zoning regulations. It's been there. Um, and, it, and they do test it around three o'clock on Wednesday, every Wednesday. The decibel, I took a decibel reading yesterday, it went up um, 23 points at what, at the time I took it when the generator was on. Plus it is a diesel generator and it, it admits significant fumes onto my property. That That's primarily, and, and there was no contact with me. The first I was a, aware of this going on was um, in fact, when I got the zoning notice, um, they've been doing construction there. I don't think that they mentioned that and it's been quite loud. So I was not aware of the significant increase in sound. Okay. And um, Mr. Kaven, could you just respond briefly um, with respect to the, um, the emissions from the diesel generator? Is there any bit way of controlling those emissions or uh, limiting the impact that Ms. Eisenberg has described? Uh, actually, uh, what happens is that, uh, well, let me just get rid of, so, okay. What happens is that in so far as the noise is concerned, we ran a 24 hour test with uh, Thornton and the, you have that as in the materials we submitted. Uh, and the noise is basically less than the ambient noise at the property line. Uh, and so far as the running, at, uh, if you take a look at the Thornton report, roughly on Wednesday, about three o'clock, that's the spike in the ambient noise in the area. Uh, you, you see that in the graphs. And so far as uh, 
I'm sorry, what was the other, the other point you wanted me to go to? The, the diesel fumes? Oh, yes. We used to run our generators on natural gas. The problem you have there is natural gas is not allowed anymore. And diesel is a, one of the requirements for running the standby emergency generator uh, as a power source. And so uh, this uh, actually, uh, we had to change from the old generator to diesel because that was what the fire departments wanted. So that was a requirement to the city. Uh, so uh, that's why we put in a diesel generator and the Cummings diesel, uh, if you notice, uh, we have the sound attenuators and uh, we had to do it basically because that's a city regulation. And, and is it, am I correct to understand that um, there couldn't be a time where you didn't have a generator in place because of the life safety um, and fire issues um, yes. so that, that, that um, whether the proposed generator or a different generator was in place, it was necessary to support the, the fire systems? Absolutely, because if, uh, this, this uh, generator is designed to pump water to the 12th floor of the building under pressure. And so it's size, the minimum size, which will get us up to putting uh, low water on the 12th floor of the building under pressure. So that's how Cummings designed it. And that is contained in the strata report. So regardless, in answer, you are absolutely correct in what you say. Uh, it's the minimum size that we could have to support the life, say, the fire suppression system. Ms. Eisenberg, did you have anything else that you wanted to add for the board's consideration? Well, I just want to emphasize that it's not a proposed generator, it's an existing generator. And in, in, in between now and when your decision is made, are they permitted to just continue to run well, it? I, I have to say, I'm, it, my guess is the board, the board has to make a decision on the request that's been made, um, which are a special exception and a, a dimensional variance. Um, but um, if there's another uh, city entity that requires some life safety equipment to be in place, we don't supersede that decision. So um, the, it is it is a challenge um, in terms of, of life safety that, that we um, we have to take into consideration as well. So, all right, um, I, we're going to close this hearing. Uh, we're going to accept the evidence that was presented. Um, I, I'm so sorry, I, uh, Mr. Coleman, was there anybody else who wanted to present testimony in this hearing? Yes, we have two more hands. Oh, I apologize. Thank you. I, I was assuming we were going to close. Um, next, we have Suella Pipple. Good enough. Could you identify yourself with the record, please? Suella People. I live at 1640 Deniston. Okay. Um, I've lived there 19 years, and um, Max and Tara's generators must be tested frequently because I've heard them all those years and um, I'm hearing the new one, which must have been, te been testing this morning for some time, although it's not a Wednesday. Um, behind, I, I am Mrs. I behind Mrs. Eisenberg's house and three other large houses in a row of small, a row of small houses. So I'm well away from Maxim Towers, um, but, and I am living in a, heavily populated area of a mix of large and small houses. Deniston Street is a well-walked street for access to the commercial area of Squirrel Hill. Um, we, have, we travel within very few feet of that um, generator enclave. It is awfully close to the sidewalk. Um, and I'm surprised that there was no other area to site it in or that you know, no improvements have apparently been made in generator construction because Maxon Towers has been spending a huge amount of money upgrading and renovating their apartments and building a large event center or 
office uh, um, for sort of IT things for their tenants, um, party area in the back of uh, behind uh, or and next door to the swimming pool. And this we, has gone up. we appreciate your concern. Is, with, I'd like to focus on the generator because that is the only issue that's before the board. Was this new construction? Did it require, was it one of the reasons that an additional generator required? The, the issue before the board is the generator and the um, setback being requested from Denison and the yeah. noise level. So the, I'd like to focus on those issues. And but, I appreciate that you have concerns with additional uses on the property, but uh, the board is only being asked to consider those items. Yeah, well, if an exception was requested because additional uses were put on the property, I mean, the fire exception is very serious. We all understand that. But was it was um, what are the new demands being made on the property that is have just been made over this past year? The the issue is the like I said, we're we're, we're only being asked to consider a special exception, which is a term of art under the zoning code with respect to the noise level or the decibel level for the generator and the distance the generator would be from, from Denison. So- Well, thank um, you for letting me make those points. Thank, and and we, we, we appreciate that. We understand that this is a the context of the neighborhood that we need to understand. So we appreciate that. Um, is there, uh, did, Mr. Coleman, I, I understood that there was one other person who would like to participate? That's correct. Um, Claire Kaleek. Actually, it is Paul Gilbert who is here with me. I am Claire Kalig. I am one of the owners of Maxon Towers. Paul Gilbert is the project manager for the work that was done. And he's on the list. Hello, um, uh, this is Paul Gilbert. I just wanted to uh, clarify uh, two things. Um, one being uh, the testing, there are there is an existing generator that runs tests on Wednesdays currently. Monday. I'm sorry, it runs on Monday, Mondays currently, and then the new generator in question does run on Wednesdays 15 for 15 minutes each week. Um, I also wanted to clarify that this generator would only run in an emergency situation besides those test periods every week. That's all I wanted to clarify. You said, could you just clarify that there is an existing generator that is separate and apart from the current one proposed? Correct, there is, yes. And um, would that continue to operate and be tested on Mondays? Um, yes, unless that were to change, yes. Um, they, they, when they first were set up, they both were running uh, at the same time on Wednesdays and we had changed that um, to cut down on the noise based off of the noise study um, from Mr. Thornton's. And school across the street is out. We pick three o'clock because school across the street, I believe is out at that time. Oh. All right. Um, Mr. Coleman, is there anybody else who wanted to participate in this hearing? Yes, we just got another hand. Ryan Wotus. Um, Mr. Wotus is counsel for the applicant. Did you have the, the presentation has been made and is fairly comprehensive. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add, Mr. Wotus? Yes, Madam Chair, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity. Just one thing that I wanted to make sure was clear on the record. I know that um, Mr. Kamen hit on it, um, and it's also included in the acoustics report, is uh, the 91609 uh, request for the waiver of the residential compatibility standards for the noise, which is under 91606, provides that uh, the sound level during the daytime period, which is, um, it, is basically... Uh, said as it, it should not exceed 55 decibels or three decibels above the background sound level. I just wanted to make sure that, that it was clear in the record that uh, based upon that report, the generator emits uh, 62 decibels. And during the time period in which it would run, the, uh, the ambient sound level pursuant to that report 
uh, routinely exceeds 65 decibels and often reaches 75 to 80. So I just wanted to make it clear in the record that the standard basically is either 55 or three decibels above the background sound level. That's how it's to be calculated. And what's, what's per, um, basically what's being provided by this generator is actually less than the background ambient noise. We, we appreciate that clarification. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right. We're going to close the record based on the evidence presented um, and we'll take into consideration the concerns that have been reflected in the testimony. Um, but we thank you all for participating and we are going to close the hearings for the day. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. And we're, um, Zubin, you're going to take us off live. Yes. Let us know. Thank you all.